Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello, and welcome uh, to those of you joining us in person as well as virtually via HowlRound TV. Um, my name is Ramona Ostrowski, and I'm the producer here at HowlRound. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, HowlRound Theater Commons is a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide, and we amplify progressive, disruptive ideas about the art form and facilitate connections between diverse practitioners. And we're based here in Emerson, in Boston, uh, in the Office of the Arts. So we are so grateful to have critic Naomi Herzog and Philip Arnaud, director of the Center for International Theater Development, here for this lecture and conversation. So I'll bring Philip up in just a minute to tell us uh, a little bit more about how this came to be. But first, I just want to say a big thank you to the Trust for Mutual Understanding for supporting this event, to Josh Polster for allowing us to open up and live stream what was going to be a guest lecture in a class, um, and to our colleagues in the Performing Arts Department and the staff of this space for all their support. And now I'm happy to introduce Philip Arnaud. But I've been working, there we go. I've been working in Eastern Europe. I went to Poland in 1975 at the invitation of a Polish director, uh, Jerzy Grotowski, who you will meet in your journey across the eons in the globe of theater. Uh, and I've really never stopped working there. I work in Russia, I work in uh, Poland, I work in Hungary. Um, in 2010, I was asked, I was in Budapest in April uh, and was asked to come to a festival of independent theater that was going to happen that September. I had done a lot of work there three years before and they said, Philip, we really want you to see where this independent field has gone has gone, has grown, uh, and I said yes, I was delighted that I would speak. I got on the airplane uh, heading for Moscow the day that Fidesz, the party that's been now ruling with a, a, an iron fist in Hungary ever since, 10 years ago, I saw the beginning, really what was the beginning of a ther authoritarian right-wing rule that now is in a lot more places than Hungary. To give you just a few quick little snapshots, I, the festival I was going to go to was canceled. Within three months, the government pulled the money out. In the summer, uh, all of a sudden, directors of theaters in the provinces were being replaced by party hacks. Then they became a tax on the director of the National Theater. This is 2010, Robert L. Fodi, because he was not only gay, he was Jewish. And they were arguing on the parliament, on the floor of the parliament, that we shouldn't have a Jew lead the National Theater of Hungary. We certainly should not have, they called him Roberta on the floor of the parliament. The first meal I had, I decided to go anyway. Festival was canceled, but I wanted to see what the hell was happening in a country that I had spent a lot of time, two decades before this. And I sat down with a man who some of you, one or two of you may know, Janos Sass. Sass was a theater, is a theater director, a film director. Uh, Steven Spielberg hired him to do the Shoah the Hungarian section of the Shoah film. 
And I brought him to ART here, and he probably directed six or seven productions. He ran the Actors Lab. Uh, he was spending a lot of time between Boston, Cambridge, and uh, Budapest, but my first dinner with him, first day in Budapest in the fall of 2010, he said, Philip, I, you've got to help me leave this country. I can't live here. And he opened up a, his computer and showed me a website that looked like a college yearbook. And in Hungarian, at the top, it said 200 Jews, homosexuals, and liberals in the arts. There was a picture of him, a bio. He had kids. I think that was his address. Um, and I saw nothing, but there were very few bright spots that I could find, but this spiral of censorship of the margins of the theater being attacked. But I, I kept on. Uh, what we do at CITD is pretty simple. After doing it for 25 years, I can say we show up, we witness, we help tell the story and help artists take the next steps for collaboration, and we've continued to do that. I was there in March, two weeks after the election. They, the, the, the bad guys that were elected in April of uh, 2010 were re-elected in April of 2018. Budapest was in a bubble. They, were, they did not think that the Fidesz government was going to, there was going to be some erosion. But everybody woke up the day after the election finding that it was worse than it was before and that it was the countryside that put Fidesz over the top. This, and I was there in May, not March and felt like the summer was going to be a tough summer because they'd be able to make things happen in the quiet of summer uh, and that it would be important to find an authentic voice, somebody who's living that reality, to come and to share that with us here in this country, with the artists in this country. I, at last count, I think, CITD has brought something like 57 American theater professionals to Budapest for festivals, for co-productions. Uh, Noemi, who I've known for the last decade, she was a your age and a young undergraduate student when I first met her, and she's now uh, a senior editor at the major theater magazine in Hungary. She seemed to me to be the the, a wonderful choice to come and to tell the story that, of what's going on now. This is the last day she's flying back to Budapest tonight. She's been here 11 days, and in the 11 days that she's been here, there have been at least three major events that, are effect, that will affect, that are affecting every theater artist, literary artist, uh, the government, while she, three days ago, announced a new subsidy methodology. Uh, two friends of mine <clears throat> that I value their take on what's going on <coughs> said to me uh, in phone conversations a week before Noemi got here, they said, Philip, something different is now going on. The government had been attacking the fringes They've been attacking the weaker artists, the weaker institutions. They're now going after the major institutions to take control, and they're now going after the individual leaderships. It's really a dark time. And the way to keep a little bit of sunlight, a little bit of light in that dark time, the way I can do it is to keep the doors open to keep helping to tell the story uh, 
And to know that, I'm going to leave you with one quick set of, circum, uh, of um, numbers about what's happening in the American theater. In 2015, there were 86 openings in theater leadership in America, the top artistic directors, 86 changes. Since that time, 69 of those positions have been filled. 32 of those positions are now filled with women. They are, the number of women now leading American theaters has doubled in the last three years. Because there were 16 before that left and now they're 32. There are now 18 people of color that are leading Institute American Theater. Before, there were eight. And most importantly, we're seeing a generational shift. We're seeing a generational shift here that is gonna take some time to pay off. But what Noemi will talk about and what Noemi brings to me is a hope that there is this new leadership emerging, new artistic leadership, new institutional leadership that's going to be fighting the good fight. So let's, with me, welcome for her last lecture on this five-city tour, Naomi Herzog. I also work in um, the Hungarian Jewish Museum, so all these perspectives will appear in the presentation about Hungarian theater today. Um, we are a monthly. Uh, we have 10 issues a year. And if you perhaps, as I see, you are here and you would like to follow and you keep, uh, Hungarian events and you keep an eye in Hungary. So if you are still interested after my talk, then um, you can actually subscribe to our newsletter, which is written for a foreign audience, giving background information, partly political, cultural, political, partly um, theatrical, and it's following the new tendencies in Hungarian theater, and CITD, and it's free. And CITD also publishes a Russian newsletter, so you can actually subscribe for both. And then, as you, I heard, um, study in a global drama program, which just sounds great, that you all have a global perspective. This sounds really unique for me, so it might be interesting to you. Um, now, before uh, everything, I would like to say that I really feel with you uh, in these days that I didn't expect that as I arrive here, uh, so many terrorist attacks will happen. and. Um, so we are so much in the same boat as it turned out with the mail bombs, with the massacre in Pittsburgh, and with the uh, approaching time for the midterms. So I guess you all vote, and this will kind of determine the future of all of us. Like US is so important that I think that this kind of uh, has an impact on every part of the world. So at this moment, um, I would like to just share with you my experience that I had here on U.S. theater, because we saw a piece by Karen Finley and we saw Heidi Schreck, and I was kind of amazed in New York how angry these performers are. Now, this anger is, it reminded me of how angry we were in 2010. Philip has mentioned that this was the time of the um, election of Fidesz, the ruling government now in Hungary, and it was kind of the 
dictatorship reappearing in Hungary after the regime shift in 89, because we are a post-Soviet country. And, um, you know, it's great, I think, that you are angry. <laughs> and it was great to see this anger, which I don't really experience anymore in Hungary. It's more like an apathy now that I experience. So, to infuriate myself a little bit and to a little bit give you some kind of introduction to our political everyday lives, let me read two statements to you. And your only job is just to listen and I will ask you something afterwards. It will be very easy. First one sounds like that. We don't want to get rid of anybody, only we don't want to let anyone in here. Multicultural means the co-living of people with various civilizational backgrounds, the coexistence of the Islam, the Asian religions, and Christianity. We will do everything to protect Hungary from that. So this was the first one. Now the second one. For us, people coming from the Islam world do not mean a threat. We greet them as the delegates of a high culture. Now the question is easy, what do you think? Do these statements belong to the same person or they were actually said by two different people? So if you think they were said by two different people, please raise your hands. And I guess you have already found it out that it was actually said by one person and that one person is um, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, and uh, both of them were said in 2015, like a couple of weeks difference were between the two uh, declarations. The first one he said in an interview to the Daily Economics in Hungary and the other one was said at the General Assembly of the Arabic Banks in Budapest. So if certain colleagues of mine uh, in the professional circles heard how I started this presentation, they might told me um, it's not professional. I mean, from a theatrical point of view, it's not so professional to start a talk like that. Uh, because there is a saying we hear very often in Hungary today, ne politizai, and it's actually, let's not talk politics. But today, I think, even if our topic is theater, I'm sorry, but I have to be less professional then, but you know, theater is so much uh, interlinked with politics today in Hungary, especially political theater, that it makes sense not just to complain about things, but give you a little bit of a background um, what's happening today in the cultural political field. So, from a distance, it might seem that there is actually democracy in Hungary. Why? Um, we have elections in Hungary. We have parliamentary elections, we have local elections, but this gerrymandering, this redistricting is familiar to you, that it's quite the same in Hungary. These elections are free, but not equal. So Fidesz has a two-third majority in the parliament, but in the elections, they only got half of the votes. And this is how these things can happen at the same time. We have an opposition in Hungary, and their opinion actually is even published in the opposition media, in the remaining platforms mostly online. But um, you have to know that all the state media is the mouthpiece of the government right now. It's only propaganda and all the state advertisement goes there. No one advertises in the opposition media, not even multinational companies or private companies because they know that it's not a deal for them since the government wouldn't like that. And competition is overruled by uh, loyalty and patriotism today in Hungary. Um, we have independent courts and we have a Supreme Court in Hungary, but uh, they are full of Fides people today. There are trade unions, there are NGOs, and you have the loyal ones and you have the critical ones from those. And the dialogue between the government and the NGO NGOs only happens with the loyal ones, of course. So there is no dialogue between two different opinions. The, what Philip has just said in his introduction that there has been a an, uh, an idea of introducing a new subsidizing system in the theater a couple of days ago. This also happened without a co dialogue with the theatrical field itself. So it's all happening arbitrarily and it can actually lead to the disappearance of several important private and in, uh, independent companies uh, 
and maybe also some smaller uh, public theater venues. It may be interesting to you as US citizens that soon, if you want to, but I don't think so that you want to, can listen to some Hungarian opera pieces because uh, our national opera is touring in the US from Hungarian government's money. Um, it actually costs four million dollars and it's more than 350 people traveling here with like 80 pieces, like eight pieces, not 80. Um, anyway, um, these, this tour shows that if you are loyal, if you are uh, the loyal artistic director of a big institution, you can tour in the US from government money. So there is actually money for culture in Hungary, only it's given to the loyal and uh, they, it's not in interesting that who is interested in the topic actually in, on your part. Um, maybe you would be more interested in the works of Martin Boros, who is actually produced by the CITD and uh, the government just, uh, I will tell you about the subsidizing system in this part later on. Uh, so on the surface, it seems that there is a never seen cultural export from Hungary, but in reality, this is a pseudo thing because it's not the mostly professionally interesting things that tour. And this is how, the system of national, so this is how actually a system which is based on no communication at all with the different voices, with the critical opinions can be called the system of national cooperation. A month ago, um, in the European Parliament, there was a vote. I don't know if you've heard about it. Hungary belongs to, at this point of the day, uh, we are part of the European Parliament. And, um, uh, the European Parliament declared that Hungary is at a risk of breaching the core values of the European Union and they cited like 12 concerns among which you can find um, the academic freedom, right of minorities and migrants, corruption in the first place. And there our Prime Minister um, gave a speech and he said we are only punished because we have a different opinion and that it's not okay to silence the different opinion in the EU. So yeah, look, I see you're smiling because it's actually something, exactly what he is doing in Hungary, silencing the different opinion. So there was laughter in the European Parliament as well. Um, so, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so actually, why is all this exotic thing interesting from a US point of view? Like we are a post-communist country with a completely different history. But by now, I think you've realized that Hungary um, with this different history now actually belongs to this world trend of hybrid uh, democracies. And it's very nice to say it like that, hybrid democracy, but of course the name refers to a kind of dictatorship, a modern kind of dictatorship, which realizes that it shouldn't weaken itself by expressing its real nature, its violent nature, if it can keep uh, power in one hand in most, more sophisticated ways as well. So that's why I'm showing you this picture. This is actually not a picture from Hungary, it's a picture from a piece from Berlin by Milo Rau from last year when he created the first world parliament in the history of mankind and he invited representatives like 60 of them from all over the world. So I'm just showing to you that theater and parliament are actually interconnected in contemporary theater and this is contemporary reality in Hungary today because opposition is so much in minority in our parliament that to take action there is impossible, but uh, the place as a pseudo venue just exists and politicians go there every day. So the question is today, I think, in Hungary, how to take as citizens this action back. Now, we won't answer this question today. I think it's just too big to answer it, but I will show you certain ways how the theater in Hungary can answer this status quo. But before doing that, let me tell you a few symptoms of hybrid democracy in Hungary today. First one is also a trend. 
the general turn away from politics, which I'm sure is happening here as well. In Hungary, it's partly due to a great disappointment in people. We went to the streets, nothing happened, so we don't go to the street anymore. And partly it is also due to existential dependency. Um, and also, um, before we only had financial censorship in the country, and by that I mean um, financial pressure, for example, you are a theater and you show a piece which may have certain political connotations, so your subsidy is cut. Because as a post-Soviet country, our subsidy system was created in 49, and it's basically the same since then, but in 2010, there were certain changes, and now we have three categories of theaters, which means if you are a national theater, uh, you get normative subsidy. You're, you don't have to worry about money. Uh, you get it every year and you are okay. You can belong to a special category. It's still a normative subsidy and still you are okay, but it's less money. And then uh, you can belong to the rest. It's actually called the rest. And the rest, uh, independence belongs to the rest. And you don't get a normative subsidy. It's quite like here, but the difference is that it the sphere in you exist is politicized. So it may be that you are very amazing, you are doing amazing work for like 20 years, but you won't get your money next year. It's also possible. Anything can happen. Now, uh, with financial censorship, you have to think of public theaters, you present your show, there are certain political connotations, and your subsidy may be cut, and you just cannot prove uh, the connection between the two events. But, uh, as Philip has, has mentioned, now um, the um, uh, things are getting a little bit darker, so more evident uh, since September. Uh, and there is a new flow of censorship in the country. We, use, we used to have hate campaigns. You might have heard about our hate campaigns against George Soros, for example, in billboards. But um, in this spring, this, these hate campaigns shifted to the sphere of culture and several um, artistic directors of important institutions were attacked in the press. Now, if the press is not independent, and it's the mouthpiece of the government, everyone is reading these articles as uh, the messages given by the government to you, and we were waiting what kind of consequences will follow these articles. In September, we had the first consequences. Um, there is a very uh, important institution in Hungary. It's not only the literary museum, as I've written here, but it's also a huge complex. The Theater Institute belongs there. Uh, several culture, um, artistic venues belong there, and also the literary museum, yes. He was the first person who was attacked in these uh, press campaigns, and in September, he was actually dismissed. Now, sometimes um, the staff of the theaters are also asked about who they vote for, who they support as an artistic director um, for their own theater. And um, the theater of the Operetta in Budapest, uh, the staff was actually asked who they support, and more than half of them supported Jörg Lörinci, and only 9% of them supported Attila Kisbe, who um, whose tender wasn't even public by that time. Now, a supposedly independent committee voted for Attila Kishbe, so the guy who only got 9% to get the theater. So you see that this is a different way of censorship happening now. There is a journal, which is actually a pro-government journal on economics in Hungary, which published an, an, an essay which was slightly criticizing the Fidesz politics. Uh, the next day, um, the volume di uh, disappeared from the internet, the whole issue was eliminated, and the whole editorial board was actually dismissed and replaced by different people. So it's not a surprise that there is a self-censorship flow in Hungary today, and these are uh, important institutions from the Hungarian Science Academy to uh, the University of Economics um, to several um, in, in their appearance, uh, independent venues, but they are mostly owned by Fidesz people. Uh, so they, they started to cancel 
lectures and events which were possible to be read and understood as uh, politically um, uh, connected topics. So if a topic was professional, uh, but it might have political connotations, it was canceled from refugee issues, you have to think uh, like these topics, um, gender issues, Freemasons, a conference on Karl Marx, these events were canceled, even though they were professional events. Um, and they were not on the level of actual politics and everyday politics. So let's see what kind of an answer theater gives for that status quo in Hungary today. Um, we have a tradition in Hungary. This is the longest tradition in political theater that we have, and that is coded theater. I don't know if you know what I mean by that. Um, actually, it's like uh, presenting the classics because the texts before the regime shift in 89 were checked uh, by institutions in Hungary, so you had to hand them in. Um, and that's why uh, we mostly used classics, but on stage, the the actor can keep a longer pose or, or uh, can do other non-verbal gestures to express polit political views. And this is a great tradition in Hungary. You can see um, one of the most important theaters in Budapest presenting the great dictator, um, the great US film by Chaplin. Um, and on the wall of the theater, you can see a huge poster on with just saying great dictator to the public, so it's evident to everyone what the message is. Um, but it's still uh, following that well-known tradition, which was more apt maybe before 89, when you still had to uh, check the texts, which you don't have to do today. But actually, the message is also evident. So I don't know if um, it saves an artistic director from a dismissal. Um, that's why it shows that after a certain age, uh, our directors just um, follow those traditions that they've been socialized in. Uh, and there is another example for that from another very important theater in Hungary by Andrei Sherban. And on the picture, you can see uh, Robert Alföldi. Philip has already mentioned in his speech. And uh, he's a very important actor, director in Hungary. And he's also important because he uh, he has been the artistic director of the National Theater. Um, and they had a history together with Sherban there. Sherban did uh, an Angels in America uh, with, with Roberto Alfredi there. And now he is in the title role of uh, Richard III. And um, the first night was right before the general elections in 2018 of the piece. So at the opening, um, that scene at the end when the dictator returns and his dead figure, um, this sinister and frightening figure just walks through the stage and he's smoking and it's very ominous. It was read by and understood by the audience at that time very much as a prediction for Orban's re-election, which actually happened afterwards. Now, this is another tradition in Hungary, propaganda. Um, the piece I'm showing to you is a mass event from a very emblematic square of Budapest called Hero Square. And the name of the square already tells you that these are actually, the piece is about the great heroes of Hungarian history. But um, from this narrative, actually certain, certain minorities are missing, the not so her heroic ones maybe. Um, the protagonists of the show, even though there are so many people participating in it, I would say are the statues, just like um, if you've heard about in the 30s in Italy about uh, those huge uh, uh, events by Alessandro Blasetti uh, for like 20,000 people, uh, protagonist, with the protagonist of a Fiat 18B vehicle. In this case, it's also not the people, not the actors who are in the focus, but are, these are the statues. And it's presented like to 4,000 people. It was so cold there, I was freezing. And from this narrative of Hungarian history, the Roma minority, which is the biggest minority in Hungary today, is just excluded. Um, and with the Jewish minority, it's a little bit different because the government has a dual attitude to the Jewish minority today. So um, 
On the one hand, our prime minister declares zero tolerance towards anti-Semitism. On the other hand, you have these hate campaigns against George Soros, and you have uh, a memorial of, Ger of the German invasion established uh, in 2014, I think, at the Liberty Square, a very emblematic square in Hungary, which is completely eliminating the responsibility of the Hungarian nations uh, uh, in the death of 500,000 Hungarian Jews in the Second World War. So, so much about propaganda. We have political cabaret in Hungary. Um, to the left, you can see Tap Theater, and their artistic director, Vilmos Wajnai, boy, they may be uh, familiar to you. I mean, maybe not him, but his former friend, who was Peter Halas. And Peter Halas did Squat Theater in New York, which you, um, and actually it was CITD that helped him escape um, in the 70s to New York. He's among the very few whose theaters were actually banned in the previous dictatorship in Hungary. And to the Right, you can see uh, our only stand-up comedist who is dealing with political topics today, uh, because this is something you don't do as a comedist today, but uh, he is an excep exception. We also have documentary theater in Hungary today, and um, uh, among them, the first one, the first group that specialized in verbatim theater was panodrama. Verbatim theater is when you um, do shows based on a fixed text, word by word, written down by, uh, oh, maybe you are familiar with what it means, but um, they are working with actors and this text edited but based on these interviews are given to the actors and uh, they perform that but uh, it's not done with um, non-professional actors. Now I'm showing you this picture about their artistic director Anna Lengyel because on this picture uh, you can see that she is suffering from cancer right now and I'm only showing this to you because she is very open about that as well. And she is constantly posting about that on Facebook. She is organizing a roundtable uh, series on the topic. And she is also uh, working on a piece um, which, is, which will be about cancer. And by that, she is fighting against all the assumptions in us that we, are, we kind of feel that cancer seems to be undefeatable. And um, she is, on the contrary, saying that she will live up to 90 years. Three young artists uh, now. Um, the first one, the first one is actually two. Um, it's um, Christoph Kelemen and Bence György Pálinkás. Uh, you can see them on the picture, or you see Christoph. This one is Christoph. They actually made a conceptual documentary work on a Hungarian plant or it's actually an alien speech, but most of the Hungarian people consider this to be the most Hungarian plant ever, even though it was transferred to Hungary from North America 300 years ago. Now, what happened was that in 2014, the EU passed a regulation on the management and eradication of alien species, and uh, even though Fidesz was suggesting the same before, now they voted against the regulation. This is what these artists used, this idea, and they uh, launched planting events and later on reenacted these in their shows, trying to reframe um, the black locust, so this alien speech, as a symbol of open society. And their, sim their slogan was, uh, whoever takes root in Hungarian soil can become Hungarian. Um, and I wonder if their project will take root in Hungarian soil too. Now this is a, a very unique, I wouldn't say it's a trend in Hungary, but she uh, represents an example for a very rare uh, appearance for feminist theater. And Veronika Szabó uh, came to the limelight like a year ago in Hungary with her remarkable piece titled Dom. She studied in Great Britain and she brought a new language to Hungary which lacks words, it's mostly music, it's uh, movement, very powerful. 
and she worked with partly professional, partly non-professional uh, actors with an international background there in devised methods. Um, it's very similar to the work of Jerome Bell, if you are familiar with his works. So um, um, it kind of confronts with the non-professional actors, mostly the female viewer, with our own expectations towards female roles and um, uh, normative body images. And that's why I think that it was, mostly it was the female audience who cried afterwards. Um, and another artist, another performer who has been mentioned already by Philip, that is Martin Boros. Um, but he is not the one and only person in Hungary who is dealing with participatory theater. And this particular piece is very, I think, very important because it kind of calls the attention to homelessness in a very playful way. Playful way. And it's, um, you, you are just laughing during the show, but you realize that you get to know so much about homelessness uh, that you, as a privileged background person, just didn't have before. So the audience is divided in just during the show into three groups, and each group has an avatar. Uh, on this picture, you can see a real homeless activist person, so it's partly a documentary show too. And these avatars have to be saved. So in each round, you are asked if where do you want to spend the night, for example, on the street, or you go to the shelter. But it's not only uh, your money, um, which you have to take care about, but it's also your life conditions. So it may be that you have a lot of money at the end, not a lot of, but you have some, a sum at the end, but your life conditions are just shit, and you died. So it really gives you all, you, you, it makes you, to be in the perspective of these people, and you have to make all your choices from the perspective of the homeless during the show. And my favorite one is coming right now, because this particular piece is very complex. This show is not only a documentary, but um, the group of these people actually spend half a year in two very, very poor villages at the north northern part of Hungary. Uh, they used social drama there, and they worked with Roma people, as I said, the biggest minority in Hungary today. Uh, they wanted to work with the Roma and the non-Roma together, but the non-Roma wouldn't come, and they didn't come if you work with the Roma. So you see what is the situation in these villages, and this was the, this was the environment they had to work with the people. And they only asked these people, what are the everyday problems they just have to face, and they used social drama to come up with certain possible, I don't say solutions, but you know, what can you answer in a hospital when you cannot say there because of racial and racist uh, reasons uh, with your kid, when you had to stay there and your kid stays there and you don't live there. What do you say? How do you solve this problem? And they just, you know, did social drama workshops on these issues, and from this material, they created the documentary piece, which they not only presented in Budapest for the privileged uh, background audience, but they also presented it uh, in their local environment. Um, and this could, as I heard, somewhat change their position in their local environment. But of course, you don't have to think of two big changes in these cases. Like if we went there now, it would be the same in this, this sense that you could only work with the Roma. They couldn't work with the two groups together. So this is, I think, a general problem today, that theater can become its very own barrier. Um, as a medium, it cannot fulfill its role as a social platform because it cannot reach those who have a different opinion because you will only watch it if you already share the opinion of the creators. So my last example is actually offering a solution for that kind of challenge. And this is um, because they are not only an artistic group anymore. They have a background in street art but now they are an official party in Hungary, a satirical party actually, called the Two-Tailed Dog Party. You can see their emblem there. Now, um, 
I have to tell you that when they ran at the elections in 2018, not everybody was happy about that because um, the opposition was already so divided that um, they, it was more difficult, you know, to, to expect a regime shift if there are more parties running for presidency. So um, they not only divided the government, they also divided the opposition. Um, but why actually they decided still to run at this election? They have different tools that they use, and one of the most important tools of these is over-identification. So what I mean by that, we have these um, pro-government rallies in Hungary called uh, peace marches done with fake civilians. So uh, the government actually wants to have the power at the same time be as sexy as the opposition can usually be. So that's why they are organizing these, part, uh, these rallies, promoting the government. But these are fake. They, these are not real civilians. Now, the dogs organize their counter peace march marches, but these were not called counter peace marches, these were called peace marches, and they accepted all the allegations they had been charged with. Um, so uh, they said, yes, we are funded by George Soros. Yes, um, we are going in a very, very nice direction, and we have to reach Russia soon, and um, everything is great, and let's do these hate campaigns. And um, by that, uh, by this tool, they can make all those hidden norms, you know, in today's Hungary become evident. Uh, and it calls the attention how theatrical and non-real our democratic processes have become. And other quite subver subversive uh, example of how um, uh, the dogs use over-identification is when they went to the state TV in Hungary. Now, you don't, you don't go to the state TV if you are a politician from the opposition in Hungary. You know it's propaganda. But before 2018, uh, every par politician from every party of the opposition got the chance to spend five minutes, no more than five minutes, in state TV to present their program there. Now, this is so absurd that during the whole year it's just propaganda, but you have five minutes to do your job. Uh, I think they call the, the attention to this absurdity by uh, sending in their chicken politicians, so their politician dressed up as a chicken, saying, God, 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 for five minutes there. And by that, by the way, in using the anchor to present their program instead of them, and also reaching an audience which they would have never reached. Uh, if they only uh, talked into those oppositional media, media, which is actually not so much anymore. So you see why I think they are so sub subversive is because uh, they can actually, it's inevitable for them to uh, be, become the part of institutionalized politics. They are also uh, working to have a real impact. Now, this impact is partly symbolic, and as a former street art movement, it's mostly restricted to urban uh, issues and restoring certain uh, derelict places in the city. For example, they have a fictional street artist called Beski, which is also a four-letter word in Hungarian. You can see uh, what kind of emblem he has. There you can see our prime minister on a Thomas train. Now, this is not only a Thomas train. This is also a line, a train line, which kind of exemplifies the uh, misguided allocation of the EU funds, because it connects Budapest with the birth town uh, of the prime minister called Felcsút. And this line is not used because, you know, there is no need for such a line, really. Um, it, it connects. It, it runs right next to the Prime Minister's home, where also a huge stadium stands in front of his home for 4,000 people, which is actually three times more than the population of the town itself. So um, why does this fictional street artist paint this emblem on these walls of public institutions? Because later on, these are, or very soon, they are removed from there, of course, because it's 
you know, attacking the government. So by this way, they can induce the government and the local government to um, take care of our public uh, values, and if not restoring them, but at least it makes them to repaint these places. Um, here you can see the former mayor of Felchut, uh, now the former plumber uh, person is actually um, uh, the former school friend as well uh, of the prime minister. But he is not the mayor anymore, so that's why there were elections in Felchut. And the, for the, the two candidates who were running for uh, the mayorship, had actually the same names. So the dogs were running somebody who was called in the same way uh, as the Fidesz candidate, and not only he was called the same, but he was called the real Laszlo Mészáros. So she, it was really, really a good tool to perplex people, and they were a little bit confused. Still Fidesz won, but with a less advantage than without that. And um, I don't know if you've heard about the Slovene artists Janez Janša. Uh, if you haven't yet, you will soon. Uh, a couple of years ago, they uh, officially changed their names to the contemporary uh, prime minister of Slovenia. And uh, this, could also, this also led to um, uh, the perplexion of the contemporary people in Slovenia. So a friend of mine just said that um, sometimes changing your name can just impact your environment much more than uh, your life. Um, and the last example, a very symbolic one for their um, participatory and active citizenship projects is the four color painting because uh, these cracked sidewalks just symbolize in Hungary basically corruption, that the money does not go into the right venue. So they kind of call the attention to that by painting these cracks in four colors. And sometimes they are even asked to restore the sidewalk into its original position. So it's also by the tool of over-identification can show the absurdity of our everyday lives. So um, actually, I think what we can learn from the dogs, because what they are doing for changing our society, even if it's subversive and even if it enters institutionalized politics, I think it's still symbolic, as you see what they are dealing with. What we can really learn for, from them is that sometimes when we just deal with unsolvable, seemingly or really unsolvable issues like how to get action back from politicians. It's just nice to start with some laughter and some imagination, just to be not too much afraid of what we can do and what we cannot. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, then just feel free to ask them. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if you felt that if the uh, coded shows, like Great Dictator and Richard III, had more of an opportunity to reach um, audiences that are of different ideology just because it has the protection of the classics and mm -hmm. the uh, underlying message isn't always as overt because it seems like the uh, the more avant-garde more abrasive forms mm -hmm. could you know push opposing ideology more away mm -hmm. while the coded can create more of a you know a indirect invitation so I was wondering if one, if you saw one having greater success um, bringing in um, different ideologies. Mm -hmm. This is a great point. Actually, um, I've heard that Robert Alferdi is directing all the coded uh, shows he does because it's exactly his, um, his quest, his, his idea that then this way he can also address um, an audience that has a different opinion and it's not only him like yeah there is a trend uh, that believes that we can address a different audience with the code it shows um, now I don't know like it would be very interesting to make uh, like uh, 
sociological research, if this is true. I mean, if you watch a Shakespeare piece, do you really think of your own reality or you are kind of stuck out of this reality and you just think of historical events? It would be very interesting, I think, to ask these audience members afterwards because this is something I really, I personally don't know. I know we build on this and, and I wonder if it's true or not. But this is a great point. Uh, I was uh, working in Russia uh, for about 15 years during the Soviet times. So a lot of playwrights were writing in code. It wasn't just the directors. Uh, so I saw a production in a tenement house. And the translator sitting next to me was explaining that's not what I was seeing. What I was seeing was the argument that was then going on and had risen to the top in the Politburo. And I would have never gotten that. They got that from what the writer was doing. Then later, when Robbie Alfodi took over the National Theater, he brought in some wonderful new actors, but he kept on purpose some of the older actors. And I was talking to him one night about the acting in code. So you can write in code, but he said, no, these older actors know how to walk on stage and cross to meet you, put their hand out, and somehow there's this complicity with the audience that they know how to play so that you know that I'm really not wanting to put my hand out to you, that I, you're the opposition, but with this tiny little sliver of the secret that we're on together. And Robbie kept the older actors there to train and to show the younger actors because uh, he was the director of that theater nine years after the, uh, after the end of the Soviet Union. One more comment, which given what you're studying is, sometimes we forget how really powerful the theater can be. And a lot of, I've seen a lot of writing about how the dialogue that led to the fall of the Soviet Union happened in theaters. That was a public space where, even though it was in code, taboo ideas were being put forward. And then right after the fall of the Soviet Union, when all of those client states were, were privatizing, everything, they left the theaters alone. The theaters were almost sacrosanct. And I asked that question once of a very smart man, Dragon Kleisch, who is no longer with us. And Dragon operated on the theory that it was the theater that were actually the building blocks of the nationhood of Hungary. Because you were using the language. They were celebrating the language. The National Theater in Bulgaria is called the Ivan Vazov Theater. How many of you here, unless you're Bulgarian, have ever heard of Ivan Vazov? I hadn't. He was the great poet. So the celebration of nationhood, the celebration of language, makes what in this country is not a very important part of our social weaving. But in that part of the world, uh, it made a lot of difference. And what's happening now in Hungary, uh, a lot of us are watching with great interest and I'm afraid with not a little bit of dread. Yeah, and thank you for telling how important theater was between before the regime shift. I think it's very important because partly what we are struggling now in terms of theater is how to how can theater regain that kind of importance in political terms that it used to have and which would be probably needed today as well, but now it seems to be more difficult. <laughs> um, so you're here telling us today about all these things going on in Hungary and all the censorship that's happening, and I was wondering if you feel like because this is being broadcast online, that the government could 
uh, like, I don't know, threatened you in some way because you're like sharing the information that mm. um, like the theaters are sharing and you're kind of broadcasting that to the world, which I, I think is very important, but I was wondering if you felt like unsafe. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I've been asked about that uh, already in Washington, I think. You're right. I mean, it's a relevant question, but I don't think that personally I could be in any kind of danger because my all of my work um, is without a state control, actually. This can only happen because our subsidies as a Hungarian Jewish museum, you know, are safe um, by, by, by that, but be our idea in, in our editorial board is that we cannot, you know, uh, think about that. We have to express ourselves, so we don't deal with that. We just exclude this. I was wondering when you spoke to a certain kind of theater that caters more towards an audience that will agree with the political beliefs that are being put on on the stage. Do you think that there's merit to that kind of theater too? Like, can it invigorate people enough to take action? Or do you think it's more noble to do theater that will bring in audience members who disagree with your point of view? Mm. Actually, uh, I don't have a final answer for that. I, I used to think it's completely in vain to talk to your people all the time who already share what you think in a kind of propagandistic way. But now, when I saw Karen Finley and I saw Heidi Schreck and I saw how, how much need there is for, for these communities or at least the feeling that we can connect and, and meet with people who share already an idea and we are not alone, that Maybe I was wrong. Maybe maybe there's there is a point in that trend too. So I I think I don't want to decide uh, which has more place under the sun. Um, I think everything has a value that that is needed, that has an audience. What is your opinion? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say that I think it's very brave of you to stand up and talk about this openly mm -hmm. online and just in general, because it can be, I'm, I'm sure, I'm obviously not in your shoes, but I'm sure it can be daunting to start bringing this up um, when you know some of the consequences that can arise from it. Yeah, like we don't know these consequences. <laughs> we just we, we just don't plan. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. That great question about whether we speak to the converted. We had breakfast in New York with a longtime friend of mine, Elisa Solomon. Uh, if you've never read her book on, uh, uh, on Fiddler on the Roof, it's not about creation of a Broadway play, it's about a whole socio-political uh, thre threads that ended up with that famous thing. But she talked about an article that uh, was written two or three years ago by uh, Miller, Mm -hmm. that she just sent to you, to, we could make that available to you, uh, which discusses this whole issue about it's a whether great you're idea. speaking to the converted. But then in uh, where uh, Elisa came down, and also Jim Nicola, director of New York Theater Workshop, we had dinner with Jim, was, no, we need to be together. It's okay for... <laughs> it's okay for the converted to reinforce each other. The last thing I will say is that there's no question in the region that livelihoods are being threatened. The director, Arpad Schilling, 
was named, in, a Hungarian director, was named an enemy of the state. He now took his wife and his family, and he does not live in Hungary anymore. He moved to France. There's a good friend of mine in Moscow, a well-known actress who would play uh, with major directors and then would make all of her money in the summer. And she spoke out at uh, when Nemtsov was murdered. She was on the bias the ne on the dais the next day, speaking out two days later. The film she was going to do that summer was canceled. Her role was canceled. So there are lots of ways that up to your livelihood being threatened, and then there's too many stories of lives being threatened. People who take risks in the theater, sometimes we talk about taking an artistic risk. They're people who do put their lives on the line in very par various parts of the world every time they get on that stage and stand up and say something which is the great strength of the theater and also what all of us are facing in these dark times. Thank you very, very much for being here. And maybe, yeah, there is, oh, okay. Um, hey, hey. Um, my question is, in, from your perspective, what is like one thing we can do after after we leave here, that would be um, hmm. beneficial. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Actually, I'm here to learn from you. Like, you are much angrier than my country is at the present moment. So I guess keeping that anger. And maybe what I heard from Barbara Lancier in New York and what Philip has just said right now, to connect, like to be with friends and to be in the community. And, and yeah, let's not be alone. And, and uh, maybe theater can also be a good tool for that. I think we need each other today <laughs> more than any days we did. Yeah, so if you have the subscription, you can read the September issue I wrote, and then there is already, I think, another one um, in process, which is an interview with Robert Alfredi, so, yeah. I would just say, in, in answer to that important question and how a theater can be a part of it, the answer is to use any means possible through, uh, all the various different interesting styles of Hungarian theater that you presented to us today, but to use any means necessary to get into that voting booth and vote mm. for the midterm elections, because that is what helps determine not just your fate, but the fate of your society, your culture, and to do it and to be able to exercise an important right of democracy while you have it because it can always be taken away from you, and you can never take your freedoms for granted. And I think we see that living in other, other countries, how freedom is something that's precious, and we can never take it for granted. And we always have to fight, and as you, as both of you have courageously done, um, put yourself in front of the lines uh, to be able to remind us of the importance of not just theater, and how the theater can serve as a means to protect and to strengthen our our, our rights, our human rights, and our right to express ourselves. I thank you so much for, for coming here and for your courage and for your understanding and insights you've brought to us here and online. Thank you very much, and go to vote. <laughs> it was a great point. Right. Well, thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, I think Philip and Noemi will be around for another few minutes if anybody has last individual questions. Um, but we'll wrap this up today. Thank you guys so much. Have a good day.